If you've been watching my videos for a while now, you would know that I am a diehard Bulls fan. But it doesn't take a diehard Bulls fan to know that this season for my Bulls have been very disappointing. Right now, they sit at 30 and 27, eighth in the Eastern Conference, which is weird because a lot of people consider them to be a top three team in the East. So I took some time out of my week and tried to put together reasons why this team is where they are. And when any team is being disappointing or just being bad, there are usually three key reasons why. First, the players. Second, coaching. And third, the front office. And I took the same approach when deciding what was going wrong with this Bulls team. One thing that's true about this team is that the injury bug has lived in their locker room for years now. And it's no exception this year, but luckily for us, it hasn't really hit Derrick Rose as much as it has in the past years. But instead, they took our best player, Jimmy Butler, Nikola Miritich, and Joe Kim Noah. But I'm tired of using that as an excuse, man. This team should be good. We've seen the Bulls win games with way less. We still have healthy pieces on this team that should be winning us games. There's no way this team should be 30 and 27. So in order to make this video, I did a lot of research. I looked at a lot of numbers, and I'm not just talking about points per game, rebounds per game. I would advance numbers, trying to figure out if there was one player on this team or one combination of players on this team that was hurting us a lot. And honestly, I couldn't come up with anything. So instead of looking at the numbers, I decided to watch some games, man. I just used my eye and tried to pinpoint things that were wrong in this team. And the first one being, they played to their competition. And this is a huge problem for a team that's trying to make the playoffs. We shouldn't be going out and giving OKC a run for their money and beating them twice and then beating Toronto eight straight times. Think about that. Toronto's the top team in the, in the league. Beating Toronto eight straight times and then a couple days later go to overtime with the Philadelphia 76ers. This team does not bring it all unless they're going against a team that they feel is worthy. And that's not the way you want to build a team. We almost lost to the Philadelphia 76ers. Granted, there were some injuries, but our team is far superior than that one. If it wasn't for Jimmy dropping 50 points, we would probably have lost that game. And it would probably have been an all-time low for this Bulls team. Even with the injuries, we have enough pieces to put together a nice record. 30 and 27 is unacceptable for the pieces we have on this team. Another problem I've seen with this team is that we really don't know whose team it is. Before the season even started, there was a lot of debate. Jimmy is our best player right now, but Derrick Rose is going to be back, and he claims he's going to be healthy, which he has been, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. But we didn't know who was going to be the leader of this team. And I'm not just talking about putting up the best numbers. I'm talking about the vocal leader. And right now, with Joe Kim Noah being out and him not traveling with the team, we really do not have that vocal leader on the court. You can see the heart and the passion that Joe Kim plays with and how he tries to get his teammates better. But Jimmy? Jimmy doesn't do that. Of course, like I said, Jimmy is a great player. Jimmy has been helping this team so much in the past couple years, and it's crazy to see how much he's progressed. But honestly, Jimmy doesn't open his mouth, and D. Rose doesn't either. So who is on this court for us telling the people screens are coming? Things like that. We need that vocal leader on this team, and right now we really don't have it. Now, the next thing is surprising to me. The Bulls have allowed at least 100 points in 12 straight games, which is tied for their longest streak in 30 years. Now, I say this is weird because the Bulls are actually leading the league in opponents' field goal percentage. The teams that the Bulls are going against are not shooting well against them. So it's weird to think that they're giving up 100 points, but it's true. There are periods of time where we have Aaron Brooks, Doug McDermott, Tony Snell, Cristiano Felicio, and Bobby Portis in the game together. And for you guys that aren't as familiar with the Bulls roster as I am, that is not a team. That is not five players that should be on the court at the same time. In that five, there's no rim protection. There's no perimeter defense. I just don't know how we could put those five on the court at the same time. And it kind of makes sense that we're giving up 100 points per game. Now, the past couple years, I haven't been a huge Derrick Rose supporter. Not because of what he's done on the court. Not because he's been injured all the time. But because of some of the things he says in the press conference. He's just not great with his words. And that's understandable. Not everyone is. But recently, he was asked about the playoffs. And this is what he said. If I can't play, I'm not going to play. It's a process. And the thing about words is that they could be interpreted in any different way. And I'm just going to tell you guys the way I interpret it. And of course, I can be completely wrong. But the way I interpret it is that he's lost his fight. I know injuries can be scary. But once it comes to the playoffs, there shouldn't be anything holding you back. Unless you can't walk. And in some cases, that is the way it worked for him. But I just think it would be better if he would have said something along the lines of, I'll try my best to play, but if I can't, I can't. That is the same exact statement. But it was said differently, and he doesn't look like a jerk when saying it. Don't get me wrong. I've been happy with Derrick Rose play this year, 
And actually, he's only set out like eight games this season, which is great. And when doing my research, I came across a couple numbers that I thought were weird. And at the end of the video, I include them. And they're pretty much all about Derrick Rose. But I want you guys to tell me how you interpreted them. Hoiberg is in his first year as a head coach in the NBA, and I have to admit, the transition from college ball to the NBA is definitely a hard one. Just think about guys like John Calipari, Rick Pitino, guys like that that just are great coaches in college. But when it comes to that transition, a lot of people can't do it. One of the only guys to do this was Brad Stevens, and in Boston, he's been doing a great job. So because of that, I'm willing to give Hoiberg the benefit of the doubt, but there are a couple things Hoiberg has done that I don't think any coach would ever do. The first mistake Hoiberg did was benching Joe Kim Noah. Jimmy Butler may be the best player on the team, D. Rose may be the former MVP, but Joe Kim Noah is the heart, soul, and the voice of this roster. Just think about the top teams in the NBA right now. You got Golden State, you got the OKC Thunder, you got the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the San Antonio Spurs. All of these teams, all of these teams has a guy on their team that plays strictly through his heart. Golden State has Draymond Green, OKC has Russell Westbrook, Cleveland has LeBron, and the San Antonio Spurs, believe it or not, have Tim Duncan. Notice that a lot of these heart players, the guys that play with their heart, aren't the best players on the team, but they are a necessity for their team's success. Oh, and all these guys are starters. See, personally, I think that Hoiberg tried to do his best Steve Kerr impression. Steve Kerr came into the Golden State Warriors locker room and was like, you know what, David Lee, you've been great for the team so far, but I think you got to ride this bench. Hoiberg tried to do that, but instead of replacing Joe Kim Noah with a guy like Draymond Green, he replaced him with Nikola Mirotic, a guy coming off a solid rookie season. I give him that. I like Nico a lot, but honestly, he should not have been starting over Joe Kim Noah. I know somebody in the comment section is going to say, oh, Joe, it was Joe Kim's idea. Joe Kim wanted to come off the bench. Nah, he came out publicly a couple weeks after they announced that he wasn't going to be starting. And he said it wasn't his idea. But one thing about Joe Kim Noah, he has one thing that he wants to do more than anything, and that's win. So he was willing to ride that bench if that meant the Chicago Bulls were going to be successful. And ultimately, it kind of fell out. Don't get me wrong, man. I like Hoiberg. I like what he's trying to do, but he has made a couple mistakes his rookie season. Joe Kim Noah is the only guy on this roster that can make the guys around him better without scoring a bucket. Joe Kim Noah was the MVP candidate about two years ago with averaging like 10 points a game. That's how much of an impact he has on the team. That he almost won the MVP. He got MVP votes with not even averaging over 15 points. Another thing Hoiberg has done wrong is honestly not really his fault. He's just too laid back on this squad. One thing Gar Foreman and John Paxson do a great job at, and it's probably the only thing they do a good job at, they put together a team of players that don't like to talk to the public. Think about it. Jimmy Butler rarely talks. Joe Kim Noah talks sometimes. And D. Rose has his mouth closed 98% of the time. So when Jimmy came out and just said, you know, Hoiberg is not tough on us, not tough enough, that really opened my eyes because it has to be true. If Jimmy thought he needed to go to the public with this, it had to be a big problem. Just think about who their previous coach was. Tom Thibodeau. The guy is notorious for running his players down. And I just feel like Hoiberg is the exact opposite. It kind of reminds me of like getting a substitute teacher. If you get a substitute teacher, you don't care. You don't care about anything they're saying. Because you know they're nothing compared to your normal teacher. And I feel like Hoiberg right now is the substitute teacher. And like I said, man, I'm not a Hoiberg hater. I like Hoiberg. But there's just a couple things. If we want him to be our coach of the future, we want to keep him around, we have to help him out. And that's going to lead us into the next topic. A couple weeks ago, I uploaded a video of me ranting about how disappointed I was in Gar Foreman and John Paxson for not making any significant moves at the trade deadline. And one thing about the Bulls organization since Gar Foreman and, and Paxson have been there, they are so afraid to make moves. And it's it's so disappointing. Like I said, the Bulls have been good for so many years, but they won't make that move to just get over the hump. Even if that means taking a step back, trading power for players that are a little less and a little younger, or trading them for draft picks, they are afraid to make that take that step back. And I don't know if that's financially. They know if we lose a couple years, like a couple years under 500, fans will come out to watch. But they are just so afraid. They would rather be good for 10 more years than be great five years from now. And But you know what? I'm over it. I'm willing to give these guys another shot if they do four things, four things at the end of the season, in the offseason, to help this team out. 
And these four things aren't incredibly impossible. I'm not asking them to go sign LeBron. I just want them to re-sign Joe Kim Noah. I talked about it a little bit in the last clip, but Joe Kim is the heart and soul of this team. And letting him go would be a huge, huge mistake. I know he's been dealing with injuries for a couple years now. I'm not saying sign him to a $20 million deal, but I believe he wants to stay in Chicago. So he would definitely take a pay cut if that means he stays here. I don't honestly see him playing in any other uniform besides the Bulls one, but there is one case. A couple teams have expressed their interest in signing Tom Thibodeau as their head coach next season. And honestly, if Paxson and Gar Foreman decide that Joe Kim Noah isn't a part of this Bulls future, I can guarantee you the first call Thibodeau makes as a head coach is going to be right to Joe Kim Noah. Joe Kim, we got a spot for you on whatever team I'm coaching. And guess what? Joe Kim is going to accept that because he loves Tom Thibodeau. He's a Thibodeau guy. He plays with that heart, that heart that, that Thibodeau teaches and wants in the team. So signing Joe Kim Noah back is number one on the agenda. Number two, please, please don't sign Powell back for anything over $6 million a year. I would be highly disappointed. I would be highly, highly disappointed if Powell decided to sign anywhere else. Not in Powell itself, because honestly, if I was Powell, I'd skedaddle too. Because it doesn't look like this Bulls team, Bull team is going to be anything great by the time he retires. But I would be so disappointed in Gar Foreman and John Paxson for not trading him at the trade deadline. He's on the last year of his contract. He's expressed that he does want to stay in Chicago, but anything can happen between now and the offseason. He can probably look at the way I do. This team is probably going to take three or four more years to even be considered a top team in the East. And even by that time, he's going to be, what, 38? Does he really want to be around at 38 still trying to get another ring? If I was pal, I'd throw the deuces up and go to a real contender. But if they lose him for nothing, when they could have traded him to Sacramento for a first-round pick and two other guys, they decided to stay with Powell. And if we don't get him back for anything less than $6 million a year, I consider it a loss. Oh, and if we are going to sign him back, please don't sign him back for more than anything than like two years. He's 34 years old, guys. There's no way he should be on this team at 37. I just feel like he won't work the same way. We already see him getting a little worse and worse every season. By 37, he's just going to be a guy on the roster. The number three thing on the list is to go get some players that fit Hoiberg's offense. Honestly, I've watched Hoiberg all the season. I've watched some of his clips from last year when he was at Iowa State, and I still don't know the type of player that fits his offense. But if he's going to be our coach of the future, we need him to have players that are going to fit his offense. Right now, I think that is one of the main reasons why our offense looks so bad. Right now, we have the same offensive numbers as we did last year. Under Th Tom Thibodeau, who really had no idea what he was doing on offense, we still have that. And Hoiberg was brought in for the offensive aspect. I just think he deserves the players that fit his offense. Like the last week or two, Doug McDermott has been thriving in his offense. Honestly, the team has been running pretty solid in the past week or so. Since the All-Star break, so that's like four or five games. So I don't know if I want to believe that yet. They have been playing solid in his offense. But if we want him to reach his max potential as a coach, give him the players that fit him perfectly. That's all I'm asking. That could be like one or two more guys on the team. I don't really know. But we just need the players that are going to fit. And the fourth and final thing I need them to do this offseason is go get guys that actually care. One thing about the Thibodeau's team, they always had players on the roster that gave it all every single night. Think about Luol Deng. Luol Deng led the league in minutes per game for like two years straight. He was an all-star one year, but other than that, he was not a great player. But he put it all out every single game. You guys remember Ronnie Brewer? I don't even think Ronnie Brewer is in the league right now, but when he was a part of the Bulls team, he was starting and he gave it all. He played the defense that, that Thibodeau needed. And those guys that give it all, those guys that don't really care, those, I guess you can call them scrappy guys, are always great to have on the roster, even if they're not even playing. Think about Nazi Muhammad. Nazi Muhammad put LeBron on his back in that playoff game. And you know what? He didn't care. And him being ejected, didn't affect the Bulls at all. If anything, it gave them a boost, more like in their morale. Just things like that. Just, just those type of players are a necessity for their team's success, man. And if the Bulls want to be successful this offseason, they have to. They have to get some more guys like that. And I think that's it. Those are just four really easy things that the front office can do this offseason to improve this team next year. That's one, re-sign Joe Kim Noah. Two, 
Resign Powell, but if we're going to resign him, don't resign him for anything over $6 million a year. Three, put some guys on the team that can run Hoiberg's offense to the way he wants it to be ran. And four, get some guys out there that are scrappy, that care about winning, and I think we can win more games next season. So in the last part of this video, I want to just point out a couple of things that I found in my research. It was kind of weird. Um, a lot of these numbers are just, they don't really mean much. I just thought they were interesting, so I wanted to throw them in somehow. And they're all about Derrick Rose, so let's get into it. Derrick Rose's numbers look great. I don't mean like MVP great. I mean like for someone coming off four years of straight injuries, he's been looking solid. But this season, Derrick Rose hasn't been an efficient scorer. He's averaging 0.93 points per shot, and that is 308th out of 321 players. So honestly, he is one of the least efficient players in the league. Another stat I thought was weird is that the Bulls have been outscored by 3.3 points per 100 possessions with Rose on the court. But when he's not on the court, we are outscoring opponents by two points. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't have Derrick Rose in the lineup? I don't know. You guys let me know. The next stat is that the Bulls are 2-6 and six when Derrick Rose scores over 25 points. And the last stat is that Derrick Rose is only averaging 3.2 free throws per game, which is really bad compared to like his peak was like 7 free throws per game. Again, these are just random numbers. I don't think they reflect how good Derrick Rose really is. This year, he's been great for us. If you did enjoy the video, as always, be sure to leave it a like. This is something a lot different than I normally do. So if you did enjoy it, be sure to let me know. It's King of the Fourth Quarter. Thanks so much for watching. I'm feeling great, vinaigrette on my dinner plate Steak and Yoda, my homie Obi-Wan get the cake But don't make the quota, they can hate but won't shake the vote up I was there when they signed the ballot Little boxing is full of names, she skittle pops on my window pane Think my new shit hot, girl, I've been in flames